Yeah. Um, we are all going through interesting times because of COVID-19 and it has uh, sounded an awakening call to all of us to try and to look at how we do things. And one area that we have to look at is the area of employment, uh, business. Uh, many organizations are actually uh, going through lots of changes. Some are scaling down on operations, some staff are being released to go home, some are remaining. While at the same time, some people are still looking for jobs and some are getting jobs. <laughs> are really uh, good to hear. And so today, in the next 50 minutes, uh, Stephen and I will be trying to share our experience to try and help these different groups. And the different groups include, there are people who have actually lost jobs. It doesn't mean that's the end of life. How do they rebrand and remain relevant? There are people who are still employed and they're not safe either. They're not safe either because nobody knows how long the pandemic will last and other effects that will come. So whether you have a job, you don't have a job, you're searching for one, you are not safe. You must actually undergo some transformation. And then there's this belief that uh, business is the way to go. Self-employment still seems very popular in mind for most people. So some people might be looking at self-employment, they might be looking at starting a business. So again, we shall be trying to share, if that's the direction you are thinking, what are some of the landmines that you need to be aware of? What are some of the things you need to be aware of so that when you in business, you also give it the right approach? So I'll, I'll let my colleague, Stephen Odieka, to take off by addressing the whole issue of retrenchment, and how it affects you and what you can do to move forward after retrenchment. Stephen. Thank, thank you, David. Um, uh, good afternoon, audience. I would like to start uh, discussing this topic by just looking at what happens when you step out of college. And if you are lucky, you get a job soon after. And I want to look at what are the stages you go through in your career. It has been researched, studied, and documented that when you start your career, you go into a stage called the exploration phase. So immediately you start working, you really are not sure what you want to do, and you try to discover yourself. And you also try to discover really what career you will end up having for the rest of your life. And this happens between the ages of 20 to 30 years. It assumes that you have start, gone to school and gone all the way up to university. So most people leaving university are around 20 years old. And between 20 and 30, you have the liberty to explore, meaning have fun, try things out, just to find out what really do I enjoy doing and what do I want to continue doing after this? But then after that, then you start thinking about settling down. So some people get married because now you have some income. And, and, but again, you now move into a phase where you are doing what you call accumulation. Accumulation here is accumulation of knowledge as well as wealth. The things that you own. And this happens for most people between the ages of 30, 30 to 40. And if things are working well for you, you will see some movements around your job, you get promoted or you leave your current organization, you move to another organization. And between the ages of uh, 41 to 60, or let's say by the time you are 40, you have a very clear idea of what your career is and you are working on it and improving yourself. Well, at the same time, you are actually, you have actually accumulated something. Now, for those who are starting in their careers um, and they are listening to me, maybe these are the things you need to reflect on as you start off your career. 
So 40 to 60 years is uh, normally referred to as consolidation phase. So you've done some things, but now you are fine tuning yourself and optimizing yourself in terms of skills as well as um, wealth. And then, of course, uh, for many organizations, including the government, beyond 60, you have retired. And we are hoping that at that time, you have some savings, which then allow you to spend your uh, twilight years comfortably and, and so on. So beyond 60 years, we call it the accumulation phase. You are eating what you saved, either through pension, through investments, uh, in, in, in your own investments or investment in your children and so on. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is that immediately you start working, you need to have thought about your finances. Because those finances will then help you plan both your career growth as well as your accumulation of wealth. And you need therefore to think seriously about how you spend, and how you invest, and how that investment will grow to afford you a comfortable life much later. And this also then touches on when you are working and une unexpectedly you get this information that, sorry, uh, Stephen, uh, it, it appears that the economy, COVID, has affected us seriously. And we feel that as an organization, we cannot retain everyone. And among the people we've picked is you uh, uh, as one of the people who will move on. So we are going to pay you off some money and, and you move on. So if you're lucky even to be paid something, then you are faced with this situation that you have to grapple with. Realize that if you had done some savings, you have peace of mind. If you have done some inv uh, investments, you have financial freedom. But if you have not, then you really have to reflect on how am I going to survive as I move forward. And if you are listening to me and you have a pen and a paper, I would just like us to do some assess self assessment. And the first thing I would like you to do is to write your age down. Write your age down. If you are 40, write down your age as 40. Then take that number and divide it by four, by, by um, 10. So if you are 40, divide by 10, you get four. And then do a rough estimate of your gross earnings per year. So if you earn 100,000 shillings gross per year, per, per month, multiply that by 12 to get your gross annual earnings. And then take the number you have gotten with the number you got by dividing by 10, multiply the two. So for example, here I've said uh, 40 divided by 10 is four. And my annual earnings, this is just an example, is a million shillings annual. And therefore, if I multiply four by one, I get four million. What is that number four? That should be your net worth. Net worth means assets minus liabilities. And that is what we call your nest egg. That is the money that you will rely on if things change, if your circumstances change in your working life. For example, you are retrenched and so on. And it's a very simple calculation that continuously you can be doing for those who are still working to assess how well you are doing in terms of accumulating something that will allow you to be comfortable in the event of a retrenchment as well as when you retire. So let's now reflect on what a job means to all of us. A job gives us structure and it gives you a sense of purpose. You wake up every morning knowing today I'm going there and I'm going to do this and then you come back in the evening, you re review and say, okay, today I did something and then you plan for tomorrow, and then tomorrow again you wake up with purpose, and you move on, you go and do something. So it gives you purpose. And for most of us, it gives us meaning. There's something meaningful you are doing, and especially uh, when you look at how much you are making and the difference that that is making in your life, in terms of building you, accumulating some wealth, you buy a house, you buy a car, you take your children to school. So it 
a job gives meaning to life. So what happens when you lose it? For those who are here who have lost a job through redundancy or whatever reason, know that it can be very stressful. It means, first of all, a loss of income. So that salary is no longer there. It may also mean a loss of professional identity. You are known as an employee of this organization. You are known as an engineer in Kenya Power. You are known and so on. So your professional identity has something to do with the job that you are doing. And if you work, there is some self-esteem and confidence that comes with it. You know me, I work for Safaricom. You know me, I work for Visca and so on. And when you lose that job, you lose your daily routine. Every day, you know, I'll wake up, I'll get into a matatu or my own car, I'll go to work, I'll work, I'll go for lunch, I'll come back and work for the afternoon. And then in the evening, or afternoon, I would leave work and go back home, or maybe go through a supermarket and buy something and so on, or go through a social place and have a drink and so on. It gives you daily routine. And it is a purposeful activity that you engage in on a continuous basis. When you are working, you have what you call a work-based social network. So you have friends at work. And, and these friends actually form a network that supports you in one way or another. And overally, a job gives you a sense of security. So if it so happens that you lose that job, you actually lose all these things. And you find yourself really stressed. And then you find that you go through an emotional journey where sometimes you may be angry because the decision was taken without consulting you. And you really feel bad that this should, should, should not happen to me. And you feel hurt. Why me? Why did they pick me and not someone else? Yeah? And you feel rejected. You feel that uh, something, these people didn't want me, they didn't like me, and that, because of that, they, 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 they have thrown me out. And also, then, if you are not sure of your future, you are not sure of anything, you really get scared. How will I survive? How will I pay rent? And how will these things work out? And maybe you've never thought about these things, you've never prepared for them, and so you can see it's a very emotive, stressful, and it can even become a medical issue if you don't manage it. So for someone who has gone through this experience of job loss, what do they need to do? What do they need to think about? I think the first thing, and based on the, the feelings that people go through, is to, to manage your emotions. You really have to find a way to even not blame and try and get some understanding around the events of that job loss. You may need to find the right time to go home and face your family and explain to them that this has happened. And, 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 and that may actually help you also manage the feelings that you are going through because you need a shoulder to cry on or as a shoulder for support. Not really to cry, men, for, for example, may not find it easy to cry. But one thing that I know is that you have to manage your emotions and try to get understanding out of the events that have occurred. So that from there, then you can start planning going forward, and which is what I'm just going to talk about next. So once you have gotten hold of your emotions, then you start thinking about the future. And one of the things, and that's why I started talking about your career stages and what you do in those career stages, one of the things that you start looking at is your finances. Can you continue uh, operating the way you are operating when you had a job? Do you have those cash flows? So you need them to sit down. Uh, most of us operate without a budget. You need to sit down and make a statement of your cash flows. You need to know I've been bringing in this much. 
like for the example we gave about a million shillings a year, it means around 90 shillings, 90,000 shillings a month. And where has that 90 shillings been going? So you need to look at your expenses and categorize them as needs versus wants, where needs are basic needs. And wants are the things that make life nice and fun. And then you need to forego some of the ones, if not most of them, depending on your financial status. Do you have some money, a nest egg you put aside that will carry you through this situation as you think about your future and what you need to do so that you regain those earnings that you've lost? And so you manage your emotions, you reorganize your finances, and at that stage now you are ready to actually think about the future. And you have two decisions or two options to look at. These options are, am I going to seek re-employment or am I going to do something else? For example, engage in business or self-employment. So let's look at the scenario where you are thinking, I'm young enough, maybe you're 40, to seek another job. So what do you look at? You will review your career. You will look at how you've worked, the skills that you've built, and so on. And then you will work on certain documentation that will position you to get another job. And this documentation is Wambawana CV. Now, I'll just highlight what I think should go into a CV. Because most people make a mistake of uh, taking a JD and translating it into, and translating it into a, a CV. No. Most CVs are written with a lot of stuff on uh, um, uh, uh, duties and responsibilities. That is not the way to go. You show where you have worked this place this year, from this year to this year, and the role that you are in that employment. And then you briefly take a paragraph to describe what you are doing there which is the duties and responsibilities, but you summarize them highly. And then you focus on the key achievements you made, the projects that you managed and how they ended. And you can just put bullets which show what you really did and use some quantities and numbers and percentages to show the impact that it had. If so it was a growth, then percentage increase. If it was numbers, then a specific figure to show the impact that you had. And you do that for every job that you've held. Then you need to think about the cover letter. And the cover letter is a statement of why you should be hired, why you should be considered. In a way, it summarizes the resume. It says, I wish to apply for this job. I have this many years of experience doing the following things. If you hire me, this is the things that I will bring on board. Leadership skills, organization skills, and you can even give examples of those leadership skills. I've been a senior manager in this organization for this many years, where I led the implementation of projects, and you can name briefly these projects, these kind of projects, and so on. So that is the cover letter. It's a statement of why they should hire you. And be a, sound a bit confident in that cover letter. Do not beg for a job. Show them that you are equipped to an extent where you are willing and ready to meet them to discuss the role that you are applying for. So you say, please feel free to conduct me <laughs> on this particular number and I shall make myself available for an interview and so on. 
So that is the cover letter. Then we have the wardrobe. And I know some people will be a bit surprised when I talk about the wardrobe in the age of COVID, because now we are doing these things by uh, Zoom. But I was following these things online, and someone said, even if you are going to do that interview from your sitting room, there's every reason for you to look good. So you need to have some good attire, a suit, some nice tie and shirt, so that you look smart and presentable. Why? Because they are assessing your suitability for a certain role. And if that role requires that you be in a suit, they would like to see you in a suit. So you think about your wardrobe, that money that you have been paid, you may need to take a bit of it and invest in a good wardrobe for job seeking. And then you need to think about your references. Here, experts are divided. Should you put them in the CV or not? Whether you're going to put them in the CV that time or not, you need to alert your references in good time so that when they are called by someone else who is actually an, a potential employer for you, they, they are not found surprised or shocked that their name was given out as a reference. So you need to talk to them, alert them. When you start going for interviews, you tell them, by the way, my referee, and you need to be aware that you might be called and ask questions about me. And then you need to polish your interview skills. What am I saying here? It looks very bad when you go for an interview and you don't know anything about that organization. You even have no idea who your boss might be. But at the same time, it is very comforting if you walk into an interview room and you see a face and you can recognize it and it becomes your point of comfort. So you may need to go online, check the company, look at the leadership team, who is who. So if you are applying for a marketing job, you need them to know who is the head of marketing. Do you know even their face? And by the way, when you walk into the interview room and the head of the marketing is there, and the fact that you know that face can easily make you comfortable. Find out about the role. Find out about the company and what they are known for. And then also prepare some questions that you can ask them related to the job in particular. Sometimes you may ask questions related to benefits and so on. It's not a bad thing to ask about them. So prepare, polish yourself. And one of the questions that normally you are asked at the beginning is tell us about yourself. Now, the answer to that question is actually something called an elevator speech. And this is how I demonstrate an elevator speech. Imagine yourself arriving at the International Life House. And you are just about to step into the lift. And you see uh, the owner of International Life House. You know him. And the owner of International Life House steps with you into the lift. And he presses floor number seven, maybe the highest, but you, you are going to floor number five. What are the things that you will mention to this guy whom you admire and you wish to work for? In that short time that the lift starts, takes off and starts moving upstairs. And therefore you need to practice writing your elevator speech, which is a summary of who you are, the value you can bring. I'm so and so, I have 15 years of experience in this area. My specializations are project management, this and this. I deliver on results and so on. But you say it in the shortest time possible so that when this guy sees you have reached your flow, but now you've created interest in him, uh, he asks you not to get off the lift, but go with him to the next floor so that you can explain further what you are capable of. And the last aspect that I want to talk about on reviewing your career issues is web presence. We have different types of social media. We have what we call social social. 
And the examples of those are Facebook and Twitter. Twitter has one foot in social and one foot in professional. But there is another one called LinkedIn, which is purely professional. Now, what I would like to tell you is that if you have a presence on LinkedIn, what appears on LinkedIn should not be very far from what appears in your CV, professionally, because that's a professional social place. And your picture should be professional also. And then you need to do some things on that professional website to position yourself, to brand yourself, which includes writing articles and posting them, sharing articles you've come across, but sharing them and making a comment about them, and saying clearly how you feel about that article, you believe in it, you like what it is saying, and so on. Because the more you post, the more you are noticed, and the more recruiters will see you. And they may just send you an invite to connect. And once you connect, they will ask to interview you or make an offer to say there is this role in Nairobi, there is this role in Dar es Salaam that we think you would be interested in. Would you like us to discuss it with you? On the other side, there is the social social, which is the stuff like Facebook. Now, I'll just mention a few things that are no-no's for Facebook. As much as it is a social place to go and say whatever you want to say, you will minimize your political statements. And if you make them, make them as reasonable as possible. You will not insult people on Facebook. And if you drink, you shall not take pictures when you are completely out and post them there to show people how you are drinking over the weekend. Because nowadays, as they Google and check you out, they will go to social media and they will try to find out what you've been doing and have been up to. And that might be the thing that might deny you that job that you really were hoping that you would get. As I come towards the end, I would like to mention another aspect that most of us ignore as a way of preparing yourself or positioning yourself so that you get another job. And this is networking to brand yourself. What do I mean by branding? It's going out consciously to create an asset, an asset around you about how you dress, how you talk, what you say, what you do, which then makes you unique and special in your own way. And you transmit these messages out to your audience so that they can receive, retain, and repeat it when it most matters. We are looking for a guy who can do this and this. And the first thing that comes into their mind is your name. Now, I'm talking about these things Today, this way because they have happened to me, because most of you may not realize, but I transitioned out of formal employment a year ago. And one of the things that I had to do was to keep in touch with people I know, including David, and some former colleagues, people I used to work with. And what that has done for me is to generate business as I do consulting. In the past one year, I've done three major jobs in addition to other small ones. This week, we've just closed out a job evaluation that included job evaluation, market research, and um, structuring a salary, coming up with a salary structure. And that job was a reference from one of the people here. I'm in the process of working with a non-governmental organization, providing them with advice on um, talent management, performance management, succession planning, and so on. A reference which came from a former boss of mine. And these are jobs that will go up to the end of the year. So networking is very important. You cannot, because you've lost your job, you go and hide yourself in shame, saying that people will know that I don't have a job 
That is where you lose it. It is said that when one door closes, if you spend a lot of time looking at the closed door, you lose out on many, many opportunities. So what do you do? Networking offers you career leads like it has done for me. It offers you increased visibility. You need to be a member of that professional, an active member of that professional body of yours, even when you've been retrained. I do speakerships in my professional body, which is the Institute of Human Resource Management, as well as the College of Human Resource Management to increase my visibility. And when you attend those conferences and meetings called by your professional body, you learn new things. So it is important for your professional development. And last but not least, you actually meet people that can be your mentors, that can handhold you and show you the way as you try to get back on your feet. So networking is something that you cannot avoid to do. You need to think about it and work on it. Make sure that you are involved in the activities of your professional body. And also offer yourself to do some things in society, which are not necessarily of a professional nature. As we talk now, I am a board member of a small secondary school in Embakasi. Proposed by a, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, whom I used to work with in Safaricom. And within the past few months, I have had a very big impact on that institution, guiding them on people-related issues. And we are still going on. I'm also a member of, the, of a, an NGO that uh, delivers water projects in my constituency, my home constituency. I am actually the chairman of the trust board. And that gives me exposure and contacts that go as far as the US, as well as people in my, my village and my area. Lastly, and this is what uh, David is going to talk about, is that some people may not want to be employed again, either because of their age, if you are 50 and above, like David mentioned, you are actually in the consolidation stage, but it may still require you to earn some money so that you go up to 60 and beyond. So you may think about self-employment. My comments here are brief. Think about the skills you have that you have mastered, that you can exploit for you to be able to do something other than being employed. And when you start doing it, start in a small way. Don't go big and learn, make some mistakes and grow as you go in that direction. Explore your networks like I've, I've done. Talk to the people that you work with, you worked with, you knew professionally so that you see if they can give you openings in terms of your business. I think I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Um, I think you've taken the audience through the journey uh, right from college up to retrenchment and thereafter and what should be done. Uh, I'll just fill in some spaces uh, to reinforce some of the points you've mentioned before we transition to offer some tips to those who are still employed and those ones who are probably thinking of transitioning into business. Now, of course, like Steve has mentioned, Retrenchment leaves a scar, you know, it leaves a scar in one's career. But how you respond to it is what matters at the end, okay? So in addition to what Steve has mentioned, I just want to uh, also propose and um, advise that one, do a candid analysis of yourself, right? To establish why you are a victim of retrenchment. Right? Organizations retrench for various reasons. Some are actually being forced by the harsh business environment, and yet others have simply decided to do an audit, a productivity audit, so that they become more efficient in the operations. So being a victim of retrenchment requires that you actually do a candid analysis of yourself and why you are a victim of that retrenchment. Is it possible that you could have escaped it, right? 
uh, what are your skill sets at the time of retrenchment? What is your character? How was your performance? How valuable were you to the organization? Now, this self-evaluation will also aid you in the next step of action where you need to now decide, okay, what next for me, right? Remember I said how you respond to it is what matters, right? So uh, depending again on the age, like uh, Steve already mentioned, you know, there's 20, 20 to 30, you know, there's 30 to 40, 40 to 60, that will determine also your next course of action. Who knows, probably you might realize that if you are retrained in the age of 20 to 30, you have not even fully solidified yourself in terms of which career works for you. You are probably working because that's what you did in college, but you are not enjoying the job. And as long as you don't enjoy the job you are doing, chances are you'll be thrown out at one time because it is visible when you don't enjoy a job. That might call for a different action point. What are your skills at that moment? What is retrenchment telling you about your skills? Or just performance or the nature of work? What is it telling you? It must be communicating something. Because remember, while you are retrenched, other people were left on the same job, same organization. So retrenchment is supposed to communicate something to you about your skills, about your performance, about where the world is headed in terms of your skills. Now, technology is actually transforming the employment landscape. And it is making some professions either obsolete or less lucrative uh, or less required by employers. Could it be possible that yours is one of them? And if it is one of them, then you cannot sit there and do nothing, especially depending on your age group. If, if you are between 20 and 30, it's okay. It is okay to reskill. It is okay to acquire new knowledge in an area that, you know, makes you happy. You know, you enjoy, you would almost do it for free. It is okay to change your career. Don't do this when you are over 50. It is okay to upskill. Tevin has talked about rebranding. You rebrand, your brand is visible in your CV. Your brand is visible the way you communicate. Your brand is visible the way you present yourself to others. Work on those aspects, you know, the CV, communication, presentation. The internet has got so much material to learn from, such that we cannot have any reason not to learn and continue improving. Rebuild a new network, even as you maintain contact with your old network. Uh, do not create an enmity with your former employer just because you're feeling bitter, you know. Naturally, sometimes you, you, you start thinking, why was I retrained? Steve mentioned this. Uh, what mistake did I, did, did I do? This guy probably just hates me. No. This is not time for you to keep that anger, to keep that enmity with your former employer. If anything, your former employer will, is probably the one standing between you and your next job. So maintain that friendship. Seek advice from your former employer on areas of improvement because your former employer knows you more than any other person. So, if, if you are to improve, if somebody was to give a candid opinion about you that can help you in life, it is probably your former employer. So seek advice on areas that you think you need to improve. That is that just what I can add on to the comprehensive views that have been given by, by Steve about um, retrenchment and if it happens that you are actually um, searching for a job 
remember times have changed. Times have changed and employers are likely to be looking for specific outputs rather than employing people. I think we need to overcome this mentality of I'm permanently employed. It has to go with time because uh, the expectations and the requirements of businesses are changing and especially if you look at the effects of this COVID-19. The consumption has gone lower. Businesses are scaling down. So organizations are only looking at what matters for them. So could you start considering that at the end of the day, what might matter for you is work, not employment. The two are different. Work is what you are able to deliver within a particular period and earn for it. Employment is probably you, you have a contract, it's a permanent or fixed term. Could you get your ready for just doing a specific task and being paid for it? Probably as you wait for employment. Now self-supervision is key. Okay. Remember, as you've all witnessed during COVID, people are being expected to deliver remotely. Nobody's coming to supervise you. The only thing that employers are looking at is your output. So if you are that type of person who got used to being supervised for you to deliver, you must actually completely change from that. Otherwise, you will not get a job or any task. And then when you attend interviews, avoid simple mistakes. Steve has mentioned some, but I just want to emphasize on others. Stop focusing so much on yourself instead of the business. You know, people focus on themselves so much and they forget that the reason why that employer is looking for them is because of the business. Actually, if employers could have a way, they could still do their business without people and earn their revenue. So for you to be there, you must actually be going to add value. So you should know more about the business during the interview, okay? Know more about the business beyond the business name and their core, core operations and services. Do you know how they performed last year? Do you know the challenges they are facing? Do you know why they're even advertising for that position? It is not because they're looking for you is because they're looking at solving a problem. Do you know that problem? When giving examples, okay? Stop giving abstract examples. Steve mentioned about what goes into your CV. You know, it should be so concrete based on your history. It has happened, it is practical. Now, another mistake I think people make is asking for salaries based on their previous employer. You are asking for a salary based on your previous employer. That is actually, you are just thinking about yourself. You, 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 really, you really don't care where you are going to work. All you care is how much you used to earn. Now remember, how much you used to earn is a function of the organization you are, their salary structure, and uh, the output you're able to give there. Are you sure that in the new employment you're looking for, the same can be maintained? So, you know, even right now, I've been conducting interviews in the last uh, one month, I've interviewed over 20 people, and you know, they come and say, I used to earn this. They are not even concerned that right now, organizations are even cutting salaries. You, you are still referring to your old salary and you expect to get that job, right? So stop giving your salary expectations in form of what you used to earn. Rather, give your salary expectation based on the value you are sure you are going to add to that business because that is what matters the business, not what you used to earn. 
if I'm to employ you because of and pay you what you used to earn, and then I'm not considering the business, right? So I've, I've just given some tips on what you need to look at. If you're running short of time, uh, if you are looking for a job, but then I want, before I go to those ones who are keen on starting a business, I want to quickly address those ones who still have a job. Despite what has happened, what has happened, you still have a job, you need to keep the job. And I'll just quickly go through um, points that will actually help you to maintain your job because you are not safe either. You are not safe. One, you must continuously upskill for you to maintain that job. And upskilling is not the responsibility of your employer. It is actually your responsibility. Mark that. It is not the responsibility of the employer to upskill you. If he happens to do it, then count yourself like it is your responsibility. Maintain good relations with everybody. Relations matter. Right from the gatekeeper to the tea girl, to your fellow colleagues, to your supervisor, maintain a good working relationship. Number three, integrity. Integrity is going to be key. Integrity in terms of how do you handle the organization resources? Resources in terms of time, assets, um, money. How do you handle it? Do you handle as if it doesn't matter to take care of it, or you handle as if it is yours? You need to be a person of high integrity if you are to maintain your job. Number four, creativity and innovation. Employers, more than ever before, are going to be keen on people who are creative. That leads to innovation. When is the last time you ever proposed an idea that led to an improvement in the business, or you really don't care. And let me tell you, creativity is not meant, uh, it's not a principle of a few people. All of us can be creative, only if we learn how to be creative. Make sure that you continue adding value to that organization. Number six, empathize with organization. It is not time to be too demanding, okay? It is not time to start questioning, why are you reducing my salary? That's not the time. You need to feel with your, your employer. Your employer is going through a lot. Why can't you empathize? Number seven, know the business. Know the business, know, rather know business, speak business, act business. Uh, Steve made a comment uh, in another forum two days ago, three days ago, and he was like, if you are in an organization and you don't know where your salary comes from, then you are just a passenger. And if you are a passenger, it means you can be offloaded anytime, anywhere. So do not keep that job without caring about where the money comes from. And that's why I talked about no business. Remember business, all organizations exist to make profits. So if you're not caring about the profit, then you are on your way out. Much as you think you have that job, you're on your way out. Lastly, I want to talk about those ones who are keen on transitioning into business. Now, all of us think that being self-employed is actually uh, it's like the best for everyone. Maybe, maybe not. Kenya has about 48 million people out of whom not more than six million are self-employed. 
Now that tells you something about self-employment. It is not a walk in the park, but it is very doable. I'll just give you some tips to consider as you go into self-employment, as you consider starting a business. These are not enough, right? But for the time left, I'll just highlight around seven of them. Number one, your functional or technical skills are necessary, but not sufficient to run a business. They're necessary, not sufficient to run a business. What does that mean? It means just because you are a good engineer, a good HR, a good marketer, doesn't mean that that is all that it takes to run a business. You still require business skills. Now, business skills cannot be acquired overnight. They are acquired over time. How do you go around that? Surround yourself with mentors who have done business. They'll help you to navigate the landmines of starting a business, which are indeed there. Number two, what business do you want to do? Just which services do you want to offer to the market? Always start from the customer to yourself. The customer is the one who dictates which type of business, which type of service would be need required. The need identification must start from the customer before you come up with a solution. Well, it is possible that you are joining a crowded space in terms of business. That means many other people are already doing that business. You still have a chance, but you have to seek for what we call differentiation. You must be able to differentiate yourself. Do not go there with an aim of doing what every other person is doing. Go there with an aim of doing things differently. It might be in terms of how the processes you follow. It might be in terms of how you engage the customers. It might be in terms of just twitching the product slightly to be more suitable for the customers, right? Number three, it helps to carry out some research on the viability of your business, especially if it is completely new. You may need to spare some time to do some research so that you establish how viable it is. Most of the time we think a business will run. That is what we think. But when you go out there, you realize, you realize it is a totally different ball game. Number four, you are not, this is just to emphasize number one, you are not an expert in business. Seek advice from different professionals. Seek advice from an HR, seek advice from a tax consultant, seek advice from a legal consultant, from a marketing consultant. Seeking advice requires you to be humble. You need to be humble enough to realize that I don't know everything, I need other people to help me. Number five, begin with lean operations. Steve mentioned this and I want to emphasize it. Start with a lean organization. No matter how enthusiastic you feel about your business idea, don't open up a big office. Employ many staff to start with. Start small. Let the business grow organically. Remember, by starting with lean operations, you are also trying to weigh the market reaction to what you are doing. Now, take note of this. The reality of all businesses is that they don't operate in a stable, deterministic environment. Even the best businesses like Safarico, they cannot right now assure you that they know 
with 100% surety what will happen next year. They could not predict COVID last year. Safaricom of all the companies, let's go even to the global farms, none of them could predict the impact of COVID. What does that show you? There's no business that can predict with 100% accuracy about tomorrow. Now think about your startup. So the reality is there's always uncertainty for all businesses. And especially the startups, like if you want to start something. So that means that you cannot afford to put all your resources just because you want to start a business, right? If you wanted to go into selling cars, for instance, and you had 10 million, don't start by importing uh, 10 cars. You have the money, you want to go into car selling business, don't start by bringing in 10 of them. Start by bringing in one and see how it happens. If the one goes, then move to two and continue scaling up that way. That is what I mean by lean startup. It goes back even to rent employees. It is okay to start from your house. Thank God COVID has reminded us that people can still work from the house. So that stigma, that notion that any business running from the house is not a business, is probably going to be washed away because of COVID. So transform your house into an office and take off, right? And then the last one, we all want to choose to start a business with others because you know being alone is very difficult. So you find most of us trying to start with a friend, you know, with a relative. I just want to put a disclaimer. Partners can either make or break the business. What does that mean for us? Choose your partners wisely. Those ones who believe in God, like me, pray over it seriously. Just because Stephen is a close friend of mine does not mean he makes a good business partner. No. Do you share vision? Do you share values? It's more about values. Some partners have a short vision. You are starting a business because you want to build it and scale it up in 10 years. Your partner wants to buy a car the, the day you make your first sale. When that money comes in, you start arguing. Before you know it, you are actually disbanding the company after you've made some mileage in terms of brand building. So do not confuse friendship to mean that is a good partner. Rather, a good partner in business is a partner that you share values. What is your vision about the business? That is what I can share now. Uh, Steve, I don't know whether you need to add in something before we, we, we close the session. Uh, there was only one question and I'm glad you already answered it. Steve. Um, I, I think you've touched, you've touched on everything that uh, we should have uh, discussed. Uh, I think it is necessary, if it's necessary, I think the audience can raise one or two questions so that we can address them. Uh, there's someone who had asked about uh, the calculation that I did at the beginning, which I've shared uh, through the chat. Uh, but I I'm saying, really, it's all about planning and preparing. Whether you are young and you are still working now, you really need to envision where you want to be by the time you'll be 50 or so. And think about those stages that we talked about. We have the exploration phase, there's the accumulation phase, there is the consolidation phase, and the, the accumulation phase. It, it becomes a bit tricky for you when you are supposed to be in the consolidation phase and you are starting to accumulate. And then it is cut short by a redundancy or something like that. It's really frustrating and can be quite emotive. That's all I would like to say. Thank you, Steve. Um... Thank you participants for, for your time. Sorry we've 
but at that time no, by... No question. <laughs> All right, okay. Yeah. My question was, I wanted to ask you whether it's necessary for someone to be on Facebook or uh, Twitter uh, or the other social media um, pla platforms, because maybe you can choose to be on LinkedIn only, but maybe this uh, employer wants to know whether you're on Facebook, on uh, Instagram, on Twitter, and what are you saying about it? If, if I may just answer you, and I'll use myself, I'm actually on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. I've struggled with being on uh, Instagram. <laughs> And, and, and it's partly because of what I believe in. Uh, Instagram is kind of showbiz. And, 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 and if you look at even in terms of uh, connectivity and bundles, it is the one which will really eat your bundles because you, there are so many pictures and videos and you, have to, you move from one to another and so on. So you really have to assess yourself and say, what value is this giving me? And okay. do I really want to be present in all these forums, yeah? Actually, there are, there are over 20 forums now. There's even TikTok now. There is a, what, Discord, there is what, you name them. But for me, I'm only, mainly I'm only on three. And I use them, actually, I use them purposely for the reason of branding. I use them purposely to discuss things that I think are important to me. I use them to brand me, whether it's on Facebook, it is branding me. If it is in LinkedIn, it is branding me. It's a choice you make. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Any uh, other? Thank you. David, uh, this is Henry. Ah, uh, Henry. Karibu. Yes. Asante. Yeah, thanks a lot for making this possible. And uh, thank you, Steve, for taking us through. Uh, I, I am one of the people who asked about this, uh, ed, uh, ed, this formula that you had put earlier. Yes. Uh, but sorry to take you back. This 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 annual salary is it is is it gross or it is net? And I gross. I know net gross. really varies. Gross. 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 Ah, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Yes. Yeah. And thanks for your sharing. We have I personally learned a lot. Karibu sana, engineer. Any other question? All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for, for sparing your time to listen to us. We, we hope that we, we've added some value into your life. We are available. Uh, you, you can reach us uh, through formal means at Visca. Um, we are also on LinkedIn. And really for us, we just felt this was an important session because so many Kenyans are going through um, a lot and they need help, whether they are employed, looking for jobs, retrenched. And so we felt this was a very important session. Uh, so feel free to reach, us, to, reach, to reach out to us anytime with a question. We shall be able to voluntarily give you an advice that can help you in, in your next step. So thank you so much. And I think with that, we can actually close the meeting. Bye all. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Bye. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, that was good. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. <laughs>